I have a question for you. How many of you know how to ride a bicycle? Good. How many of you are pretty darn good at riding a bicycle? Even better. And as you ride along on your bicycle, how many of you are calculating the angular momentum? You know, P equals MVR, front load steering geometry, gyroscopic effect? No? Neither do I. That's because we know how to ride a bike implicitly. We know more than we can tell. But that's not how school works. School tests what we can tell. I've been working in schools for over 25 years, and I've seen some of our best learners slip through the cracks only because they know more than they can tell. So many kids can do so many fabulous things, but some of them just aren't good at tests. When we can measure what they can do, not just what they can say, that's when I believe we can provide really inclusive education. When we can measure implicit learning, what people, the knowledge that people build, that they demonstrate through their actions and their behaviors, that's when I think we can capture all kinds of learning, like the creativity and idea generation of learners with ADD or the systematic thinking and detailed pattern recognition that some learners with autism really excel at, or the disruption and in innovation that so many learners with dyslexia seem to achieve. Some of our, our favorite entertainers have, have grown up with dyslexia, but also some of our inventors, activists, entrepreneurs, and even a Nobel laureate in medicine. You don't have to be really good at tests to be a great problem solver. I believe that unleashing the potential of these diverse learners is the key to our future. And I'm not alone. Many IT companies agree. They have hiring programs focusing on people with cognitive differences. Because who wouldn't want a design team that excels at idea generation? Or a debugging team who can't rest, who's physically compelled to go through every single use case. I want to tell you a story about a girl named Renee. She's at a junior high where I spend a lot of time. Renee's on the autism spectrum, and she's one of those kids where you know she has it all going on inside, but she's just really hard to reach. When I met her, she came up to me, head down, no eye contact. She said, you're a game designer? I want to be a game designer. I want to de design a game. I want to design a game with a lot of cats. And there's a lot of cats, and there's a Vale clan, and they live in the woods. And she went on and on with the story, and I thought, OK, this is great. I'm going to hook her up with Scratch, the program that the environment that Mitch talked about. It's an introductory coding environment. So I let her, I showed her the program, I logged her in, and she basically said, Thank you, miss, and told me to go away. <laughs> Renee was on education, an individual education plan, IEP, so she didn't have the same expected outcomes as the rest of her classmates. But at the end of the semester, she stood up, she showed us a 25 minute intricate animation. Lots of different narrative, scene changes, dialogue, lots and lots of cats. <laughs> she showed us, a, and, and the coding that she did was much more sophisticated than the coding of the rest of her classmates. Renee used Scratch to show us a little piece of her private world, and also that she has talents and skills that need to be unleashed. So how do we support the implicit learning of Renee and those like her, and those not like her? For teachers to do this one-on-one -on -one is extremely time-intensive, and with the diversity of learners in their classroom, it's nearly impossible. We need data analytics that can help us do this at scale. And these data analytics exist. They're already in use. They're in use in computer games, video games, phone and tablet games, any digital games. Just like we are able to see what people know and what they don't know, by using data analytics in games, and we're able to do this at scale. I'm going to show you an example. This is a typical physics test question. In fact, this is one of the easier questions from the ACT. It has to do with Newton's laws of motion. It's asking people to answer questions about moving objects. There is no moving object on this test question. To answer this question, I need to read a paragraph of text, interpret some, ter some figures and diagrams I may or may not have seen before. I then have to recreate the scenario in my head, figure out what the question's asking, and then I can begin to answer it. I'm going to show you a different way for assessment. 
This is a game that our team at Turk created called Impulse. It basically engages the player in that exact same physics as that earlier test question. Players must get their green ball into that uh, glowing blue goal by imparting a quick force with the click and guiding their ball into there, and they can't crash into any of the other particles. The other particles all have different mass according to their color, and they all obey Newton's laws of motion. So let's just listen for a minute and watch. Okay, what we are hearing... I'm gonna let it cruise. <laughs> ah, there, ah! Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna let it cruise. You gotta try to avoid it. I'm gonna let it fly, I'm gonna let it fly, I'm gonna let it fly. Ah! I'm gonna let it fly. All right. Notice he's not doing calculations or using formulas, but he's saying, I'm going to let it fly. I'm going to let it cruise. I'm going to let it float. Or as Sir Isaac Newton would say, this object in constant motion will remain in constant motion unless I act upon it with an external force. <laughs> he's, not, he's not using the same words as Newton, but through his actions in the game, we can see that he gets it. Players demonstrate knowledge in games, and we can use data analytics to see this knowledge. We can see what they know and what they don't know. Just like Google and Facebook and Amazon, data mining algorithms to see what you want to buy next, we can use data mining algorithms to see what kids know, what they don't know, and what a teacher needs to use next to help them learn. And we can do it at scale. Imagine when a teacher gets an alert that says, hey, your player just used float strategy consistently. They can walk up to them and say, oh, tell me about your gameplay. And they can follow up with, let me tell you what Newton said about that. Our research shows that when teachers connect what kids learn in a game to what they're, the science they're teaching in the class, kids learn that science better. And we don't just do this in physics. We're now using a game called Zumbinis. It's a really fun, engaging game that focuses on computational thinking. It engages players in a series of logic puzzles where they have to decompose problems, recognize patterns, abstract from those patterns, and build algorithms. And we can watch it all through their gameplay. It's not just in games that we can do this. We're looking at how to measure implicit learning in elementary coding environments, like Scratch, where Renee built her cat game, or BlocksCAD, where you can build models for 3D printers, or Arduino environments, where you can code for robotics. Any digital environment where people are learning, we can use analytics to see that learning. And we don't stop with behavior data. We're working with our colleagues to look at emotional and physical and neurological data and infuse these all together into implicit learning models, because when we can go beyond words on a test and we can look at behaviors and gestures and even brain signals to see what people know, that's when we can really capture all learning because we know more than we can tell. Thank you.